yeah okay um who will do that um okay so um yeah uh, i believe many of you have already seen the shared document um yeah and so this is this is a document that um specifies the how to install anaconda um so what anaconda is is it is just uh python and our data science um library handler um which gives us really um better way to manage different dependencies that our application will rely on um and it also comes pre-installed with different packages which would which would make um yeah uh our entire data science process uh, machine learning process and uh, our python development really easier so don't go to anaconda.com and install the specific anaconda for your operating system um, so i'm on a linux environment and that would get me anaconda uh, so let's go to the windows installation process and so um, when our download is complete um, on Windows, we'd get an executable file. Um, and so that is after downloading it, after, like we saw, we chose Linux in our case, but we'd have, we'd download it either for Windows or Mac OS or um, for any operating system that you're currently using. Um, and so after that, we'd run the installer, um, would read through the license agreement if you'd like. Um, and um, you can add it to PaaS at the moment, but that might lead to some complications if you already have um, another Python installation you are unaware of. And so um, leave this box unticked and then install it. Um, and so this would install Python and um, almost every package, not not every package, but what the dependencies that would get you started off um, to complete your challenge for this week. Um, so I think um, many of you have already gone through the Anaconda installation. Um, so once you're done, um, you'd get this Anaconda prompt. Um, and so open that and we'll get a python interactive environment um so the python repo where we would get to, where we'll get to execute python commands so i think let me share my entire screen okay so finishing my screen so once you've typed in the once you've typed in once you've opened the anaconda prompt um you get access to a terminal which has access to python so yeah so once we are here um let me go back here so once we are here and once we have access to python you can start typing python commands and um start start seeing what actually programming in python really looks like so um in this case it is um showing the zen of python which are which are 19 laws which um which show and describe the design of the python program um and so if we import this um we get the zen of python and yeah, so if you want to print hello world, which is um, the, usually the first um, the first thing any, any programmer, almost every programmer does uh, when, when starting off with a new language, um, you'd print hello world. And so um, if when you get here, um, you've really set up your entire um, Python pipeline to, and you can really start working um, and using Python. Um, and so um, there is a document for Mac OS um, and this one here is for Windows and you go through the same process if you're um, 
on a Linux environment. Um, so and the other thing that Anaconda actually provides you is it gives you a Jupyter Notebook. Like, so what a Jupyter Notebook is, it is a web-based um, environment which um, gives a better way. Like, so if you're seeing here this Python environment, this is just a terminal. And so um, having um, a really visual representation to really understand what is going on becomes difficult when we're um, working in large projects, especially um, this large analysis and data-driven projects. Um, and so Anaconda comes installed with Jupyter. Um, and so what Jupyter Notebook, yeah, it's a web application for creating and sharing computational documents. Uh, so I've, I, already have, I already have it running. Um, but after you have Anaconda installed, you'd have to you'd have to yeah you'd have to install Jupyter if it's not installed. So you can simply do that with Conda install Jupyter. But if it's already installed, um, you can type in Jupyter Notebook, and that would that would start uh, that would start your web based environment at this specific port, and you can open that in your browser and um, interact with it. Um, I've got a lot of things open, so which is taking time. Um, yeah, but so you can you can create your own notebook, which is um, similar to that um, terminal-based environment that we saw where we were executing Python commands. Um, and so, yeah, this gives us a, be a better visual representation. Um, and yeah. so it, it is definitely hard to, to see the use with just one line, but when you have, when we're displaying images um, and when we're, um, yeah, when we're doing more and diving deep into the projects, you really understand um, the use of Jupyter. Uh, yeah, so that is that is it for the installation process of Python. Um, I hope everyone has um, either gone through or is not facing any errors. Um, if someone is facing errors over the installation process um, uh, or has gone through the installation process and has faced some errors, um, you can ask us now or on Slack. Um, okay, uh, Neron, it, it is pretty this pretty similar. Uh, so the macOS installation also, yeah, goes through the same process. Um, so you just uh, click on the macOS when you go to Anaconda.com. Um, either it would, it would itself understand what operating system you're on. So for example, I'm on Linux, but if you're on Mac OS, it would probably give you the, the Mac OS installation. Um, yeah, and you'd go through exactly the same process that are listed here. Um, and so this is the visual, the visual screenshots that are, that, that were taken from an actual Mac OS installation. Yeah, and so just, this this file is already shared in the week zero folder um and i think you can go through this and if there are any errors let us know so it, it is exactly the same as the windows installation um, okay uh so can you hear me now or um Am I not audible if it's from my end? I think we can see. I can see that. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, once you have your once you have your Python setup um completed, um yeah, the next thing we're going to be talking about is how to get started with the terminal, right? So um, if you're from a programming background, you probably know the difference, but um, if not, um, 
you've also probably heard the words like terminal, shell, and bash thrown around. Um, okay, so in a computer, um, this in a Unix environment, this is um, the flow of what we have. So we have the hardware, um, and we have the kernel wrapping around it, which which manages the resources of the hardware. Um, and then we have the shell. Um, so the shell, it is the software that actually interprets and executes commands um, to the kernel, right? And so the terminal is um, the GUI that we see over the top of a shell. Um, and bash, uh, which we have here, it is just a particular type of shell, right? Um, so um, the commands are quite, are actually a bit different. Um, yeah, so I have my terminal open um, on Windows. Um, you can open your command prompt. Um, there will be some command differences, but um, the concepts are exactly the same. So this is our terminal where we write specific commands and um, interact with our computer, right? So if I go to desktop, that means I want to go to the desktop directory. So we have the view of what we normally get in the desktop. So if I ls, it is a command that um, lists all of the all of the files and folders that are found in that specific directory. Um, so uh, we can go through a couple of commands. Um, for example, this echo shell command. Uh, tells us the specific type of shell that we're using. We're using the bash shell um, at the moment. So who am I um, shows who, which user is actually logged in and using um, the device at the moment. Um, yeah, and so yeah, this ls lists your files. Um, this ls minus l um, adding another argument, which is a, which is which allows us to list the files in a different format. Um, yeah, touch, which um, creates a specific file we're going to use it when we go forward. And yeah, this different for this different commands. So if you're new to bash or um, using the terminal, um, yeah, go through this, go through this files because me just talking about it and um, telling you what this specific commands do is really not going to internalize that. Um, so one of the tasks for one of the major tasks for today is um, really internalizing this specific commands um, and understanding um, what is really that the, the that the user interface that we've been using are really built on top of this, um, and um, you can really write entire programs just um, using this commands because these commands are actual programs. Um, as well, which do some specific things. Um, so yeah, go through this, go through this Jupyter notebook that is already shared, um, and try to understand what each of each of the commands are actually doing. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think using command prompt um, and um, using another uh, a Unix environment, you'd, you'd get, the, you'd have slight differences in the syntax, um, but the but the general but the but the general idea is um, is the same. Um, okay, so yeah, this this are we're still getting started, and so I think let me go into the main part of our, of our session, which is um version control or um git so i think to make this a bit more interactive um like if there are any people one or two people who can tell me um what they think version control is or what comes to mind when um they hear version control um, okay go on thanks Hi, everyone. Uh, I think what comes to mind when uh, my hair version control is uh, 
being able to save your work in a systematic order so that in case there are any errors or mistakes in your work, you can revert to the previous versions of your saved um, work. Um, yeah, amazing. Um, Abenezer, uh, anything you can add to that? Uh, thank you uh, for giving this chance uh, and uh, for everyone. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well and I hope this is heard. What I'm saying is heard. Uh, okay. So, you can hear Okay. Okay, I'll continue then. So, I think what comes to mind is a uh, way of controlling. We are beginning. We are going to do a large uh, project, a software project, and working with teams. Uh, we need to update some features and uh, innovate. We are working with other and uh, when the uh, computers are fixing that bug, uh, we need to keep track of what we are doing. Because uh, if we're working on the same project uh, and we're not doing some things, and uh, in a game, we never want to recover something we have done. So it, it, it sometimes keeps up with what we have done uh, over the past days. So if, if you wanted to uh, go back to a previous code, we can, uh, we can really go back to that code. Uh, thank you. That was great. Um, okay, uh, last person, Mohammed. Uh, go on. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I think version control is like uh, a way to try to track every change you do inside your work, but not for you uh, only, for the whole team. So that gives the ability for the whole team to divide work and work in parallel. Instead of uh, trying to uh, wait someone finishes work, uh, so I can begin my work. Uh, so we can divide, uh, if we have a big task, uh, to divide tasks among the whole team and everyone can uh, work in a branch and uh, try to write his task and finish it and book it uh, in the get using this. One example of button control. So uh, simply get to give you the accessibility to revert like the uh, previous guy says, uh, if that's your work, if there is uh, an error introduced uh, during the process itself, or you can also divide the process and at the end there will be uh, one person who is responsible to integrate all things together and describe to the So uh, it uh, fastens the process itself and uh, makes you able to correct every change during uh, the whole process itself. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, d definitely great. So, um, yeah, that covers a majority part of uh, what Git and version control helps us. Um, and so let's go through um, each of the issues that they solve. Um, uh, let's start with the issue that Prince mentioned first, which is um, making some changes and tracking those those specific changes. Um, okay, so let me present my entire screen. Um, and so like we, uh, it's the presenting, yeah, you can see my screen. So let's say you're working on a specific project, right? Um, so, and you give it a name, project one, right? Um, and so project one, um yeah i think this would be a, a good time to actually see some of the commands as well uh the flash commands that we talked about um, so uh touch um r1.txt 
that's all right. Okay, so we create a file. Uh, we create a text file, and so we want to uh, let's say we can also use this. So we want to add something into our text file, right? Um, and so, yeah. And so let's say, hello, uh, we save our file and we have a specific version of, we have a specific version of our project, right? So we have a file um, that has hello, um, and let's say this is simply a project that we were supposed to submit, right? Um, and but now we see that this um, simple text file is not something that we want. Um, we want a Python file, a Python script that actually uh, that actually prints hello, right? So we create a Python script. So this touch command means create that file. So we have this hello.py Python file. Um, and nano is um, this uh, command line editor, um, which would allow us to edit um, any of our files. So we now create a, now create a, a file, which is hello.py, if we view it, which just simply prints hello, right? So we can now run it, and it, it gives us the output hello. Okay, so, and now we don't want it, we no longer actually want it to say hello, we want it to say hi, me, right? Um, and our requirements have changed, and we were told we don't want to say hello anymore, we just want to say hi to everyone we meet. Um, so we go back to hello.py, um, and we give it a hi. So we give it a high and we run hello.py. It says hi. We're happy about that. Um, and now again, um, your requirements change and you just don't you don't just want to say hi. Um, you want to you want to show your excitement, right? And so you want to put in the exclamation mark again. Um, so you go back again and you add an exclamation mark. And now you say hi. So what have we done here, right? We've we've started off with saying hello. We went to hi. We've added an exclamation mark. We've made multiple changes um, to our single file. And so if this was a project, um, we've made a change. We've again made a change. We've again made a change. Um, and if you go like maybe even hours or maybe the next day or maybe a week, um, and you want to remember what your program was, um, what your program was actually saying. Was it saying hello, or what was it actually saying um, in a previous time? Uh, there wouldn't be a, any way to know it, right? Um, so maybe before um, anyone with an auto programming background, or yeah, like maybe when you were working in another project that wasn't any tech related, um, you'd add an extension to your files, right? So it would be like, you'd write, you'd have hello.py, you'd have hello old, you'd have hello to, you'd have hello last, you'd, ha you'd have hello last last. Um, and so we're still keeping track of um, our project. So we're, we're still uh, using version control. Um, we're, you're trying to control specific versions um, of your of what your project is going to, um, yeah. But this is not a way to go through it, right? We can't remember um, what we did prior properly, um, and it's a re it's really going to be a really cumbersome project, uh, a process. Um, so this is where Git um, comes into place. So. There are other types of version controls that allow um, easy management, but Git is the most popular one and the one we're going to be using throughout um, your Ten Academy journey. Um, yeah, so 
uh, I think we should have gone through the download process. Um, so go to the download page. which is here, and you'll get the specific Git versions for the specific operating system that you're using. So after you've downloaded Git and gone through the installation process, um, make sure that you have Git installed um, with git dash dash version command. Um, and if you see the version of Git that you've installed, um, you've properly gone through um, the setup process. Um, yeah, and so that was the entire flow of having, um, so that was the entire flow of Git helping us really have, have different versions. Um, yeah, so after you've downloaded um, after you've downloaded Git, um, there are various commands that you'd have to run, like this git config um, global user dot name and um, your user dot email to tell Git um, the actual user that is using the computer and the email of e the email itself. Um, okay, so let's go through that. This previous cumbersome process um, of project one, but um, to actually using Git and using Git to actually track it. Um, so let's make a new directory called project two. Um, so this mkdir command is um, what makes uh, a directory. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, the space is, so it made project and uh, to as a directory, so we have project two now. Um, and so let's initialize a Git project. So the way we do that is by using Git in it. So Git is simply just um, the thing that will help us um, track all of our changes right now, right? So all those files that we made, all those iterations that we made, um, Git will is will allow us to track all those changes properly and to revert to any of those changes if a problem is found. Um, so what, what this has done is it has, it has made, okay, so I'm in week zero actually, I need to go into project two. Um, and so what this git and it has done is it has created this dog gift file. So that means this directory, this project to directory is now um, trackable by Git. Um, and so any changes that we make, um, everything that we do um, is going to be tracked by Git. Um, so let's make that same file, um, touch load up by, um, and let's get this. Right, okay, so let's, Hello, Git. Okay, so let's check that our program works. We get hello, Git. Um, and so we have this initial product which prints hello. So this is a program, we're happy with it. Um, we're going to show this to the world, right? So let's say this is our first version of the project, right? Um, but we want to know why, what this um, first version of the project is. Uh, and so what we do that is, if you do git status, it shows you um, what git is really tracking and what it is not. Um, and, and so the separation between um, what it what it wants to keep track of and what it's not. So if yeah, I think this let, let's just go to it and we'll go to back to the diagram. Uh, so we want to track this hello dot file. It is telling us we have an untracked file. Use git add and that specific file that you want to include it to make sure that it is um, 
actually keeping track of it, right? So let's add hello.py. So we have added it, and if we check the status of Git now, um, we have a new file that is hello.py. Uh, and what this, where this hello.py is, is now, what this hello.py is, is we were just in our working directory where we created, where we created that git, where we created that hello.py file, um, and we've now added it to the staging area. Um, and this staging area is um, sort of like um, the place where Git is first taking it to um, before it is completely tracked and before we have um, a completely tracked version of that file. Uh, so, yeah. So we have now this hello.py, which is just being, which is now in the staging area. So where, what we want to do now is, because we want to track this hello.py, we commit it to our repository. Um, so this, this entire project to directory is now a Git, repo, is a Git repository. Um, we did that when we initialized it with git init command. Um, and so what this git commit command, uh, git commit minus m, is it allows us to take all the files that were in that staging area and move it to the repository and really track them. And um, yeah, and actually track them. So what this minus m argument is simply a message. Right, so we've gone, we've, we've just made a file that says hi, right? Um, and if, when we change that file from saying hi to hello or hello again or hello um, someone's name, um, we would like to know, we'd, we'd have to give a solid description that our mind will probably read and remember. So what we've, what we've done in this case is we've just simply made uh, a feature, we can call this a feature or anything that we want, um, which we've made a file, um, a Python file, um, which prints hello, right? So this is, this is what, we, this is essentially what we've done. So we have now added it to the repository. And so that hello.py that we've, uh, that we've made, now has um, a lineage of a tracking. So if we do a git status, um, you can see there is nothing to commit because um, git is now tracking this hello.py. And if you do a git log, you will see, you can call this as a specific version. Um, for now, uh, you can think of each commit as specific versions. Um, and so this, is now a feature. We have a Python file which prints hello, right? So ls, let's see which files we have. We have hello.py. Um, so let's make a change to hello.py to really internalize it, right? So let's go to nano hello.py and instead of, okay, hello, hello git, let's say hello track git, right? And so we've made a change now. We've made a change to hello.py. Hello.py is no longer what it used to be. Um, but we need to know that. We, you need to be very descriptive. And um, when, if you ever want to go back in time um, and go back to, to that time where it was just saying hello git, um, you would need to know that. So if we do a git status, you can see that it's been modified, right? So Git is telling us you've modified hello.py, but the changes, um, the changes you've not told me to add those changes to the repository. So that hello.py is currently just inside of the working directory. We've made the changes in this working directory, um, and so we're happy with the new. Uh, yeah, like okay. So let, we're still in the working directory. Let's say we're in. We're still in the working directory. And we actually don't want an exclamation mark here, but we just want the full stop, right? So hello track it. So what what has happened is um, the change still wasn't tracked, but what Git 
tells us is there is still a change in Hello Delphi. Um, we're still work in the working directory. So you can iterate through this um, without telling Git to actually still track your changes. Um, yeah, but make modifications into the file and uh, on the file that you're working on. And so we're now happy uh, with what hello.py does. Um, we're happy with seeing this hello track git. And we want this to be the next version of our program. So what do we do? Um, we now add it to the staging area once we're happy with it. So we add hello.py again, and we will commit our, our file to the repository for Git to understand all the changes that I've been through. Um, and so what we do is we get commit and again, write a very descriptive message before um, adding it to the repository, right? So this can be a tour where we've simply changes um, hello message, hello message to hello tracked, right? So, because this is the only thing that we did. Um, and so we now have, if we check, uh, if we go to our logs, we now have this specific version, uh, which, have, which has the change from that simple hello message um, to hello track gets changed. Um, and so you, you now can see the use of like, I, I don't even remember right now at the moment of what the file changes that we need um, in project one were. Um, and so you, what you can see with Git here is it allows us to properly track your changes. And this becomes really useful when we're working on real world projects and when we're working on um, bigger projects. And if you actually wanted to go back to this, like, let's see, we have this hello.py, um, this hello track kit. So we realized that this is not really the message that we want. The previous message was a very much better message. Um, so let's see this version. So what you can do is you can simply go back to the previous version by using the checkout command and yeah you now have hello git back. So you're now back to your previous version, um, just like that. And so this is normally um, the git workflow that we're going to iterate to. You'll have your working directory where you're going to make a lot of changes. Um, you will add your changes to your staging area and then you will commit them into the repository. Um, and so this is, uh, the core concept of what we talked about. This is one of the core concepts that we're going to talk about um, where with Git, where it is going to track the specific versions um, that we've iterated through our program. Right. Um, yeah. So this is one of the, uh, yeah, this is one of the biggest issues. Um, and the other, the, uh, the other issue that it that has been raised that actually helps us is um, if you are actually working in a team, right? Um, so let's um, back here. Yeah. So yeah, let's see. Uh, let's say Mahalit, um, Asnaka, and Prince and I um, were actually working on a team, right? So. Um, we have specific requirements that are lined out, um, specific requirements we have to deliver and a program that we have to complete. Um, and so I start off working on one end of my project, someone else is doing something else, someone else is doing something else, and someone else is doing something else. And so all of these changes um, will really be difficult to really come together, right? So as what Git is, is it's a, dis it's a distributed version control system. So that means um, everyone has their own repository um, and everyone, everyone is working on 
specific changes at this at, at a time. Um, and with Git and um, GitHub, which we will use, really allows this allows us to have this great um, team workflow. Um, so uh, who is experienced can working experience with working with Git um, GitHub can um, actually skip this, but for those with less experience, I would really advise you go through this. Um, so if anyone doesn't have a GitHub account, um, sign up for GitHub, um, go to github.com and sign up. Um, and I think let me share this repo as well. Yeah, so let's go over the workflow of what working in a team and the advantage that um, Git would actually give us when uh, we actually work in a team. So this, right, so what GitHub is, is it is simply like, if we go back to here, at the end of the day, um, what we have in Git and the main part is just this repository, right? So this repository has all our changes, all our history, um, everything that we've done. So the meet, the core part of Git is this repository. Um, and so what GitHub simply does is it, it just stores um, one repository, one main repository where um, multiple other repositories can actually um, can actually provide changes and also pull back changes. Um, so you can so this is simply just one repository. So go to yeah, go to that URL that I sent. Um, yeah, and go to that URL and get that repository. Um, copy that repository to um, to your local machine, and you do that by using the clone command. Um, so we have have the URL. Um, so what this is doing is it is simply just taking it from GitHub and giving us a copy in our local machine that we can make changes to and push back up to Git. So yeah, you see this Git gets started. I'm not sure uh, if you can properly see this, but this Git gets started before um, folder is, in, is, this act, is the clone of, of this repository. So if we, if we see this log, you can see that initial commit that has that ha, that had actually been made, um, and so we we are getting when we actually clone it, we are getting all the history that has been made. Um, so if you are going into a big team and you are not going to start working on a project from scratch, um, you are going to have to see the changes that that project has actually gone through over maybe months or over the period of years. So we get the entire history. This just has a single commit, um, as a single commit um, at the moment, right? Um, so we have this copy of it. And what, you're, what this repository is um, aimed for is to make sure that you have your, Git, your GitHub account set up and that you can actually interact with GitHub from your local repo and understand the, some of the basic workflows um, that a normal team actually goes to. Um, so you have this in your local machine and let's say you want to make some changes, right? Um, you want to add your name, um, let's say you want to add your name right here. Um, so you don't want to disturb the main workflow, the actual working, um, the actual working piece of the of the of your store, of your program, right? Um, so you want to branch off, uh, make your changes, and allow other people to actually take a look at those changes, make sure that those changes are properly um, are properly aligned to the requirements of um, either the company or the requirements of what the team is doing. Right, so and the, that branching off uh, to make your changes is literally Git branching in. It's this branching in Git, 
Um, so if you you if you type in git branch, you'll see the uh, specific branches that your repository has. So this one has me. Um, so I want to make a new branch where I'm going to make all of my changes um, and actually push and, and actually request that um, the changes that I've made actually be added here, right? So if the how I do that is um, I'm checking out into this new branch. This minus B means create a new branch at this moment. So um, let's see other uh, changes, branch, right? So we have now switched to a new branch where we can make our changes without affecting um, the core part, the main running part of our application. Um, and so let's let's add our name. Uh, Zarya .txt. Um, so Zarya and your batch name, add your, yeah, uh, you can add your batch name or um, simply just an academy and take that file. And we've, we've now, we now have made a change, right? So if we see our file is not tracked, I would like to see Azaria.txt here. Um, that's what I want to do at the moment. So um, let me add it to my staging area. So we now have this azaria.txt right here in the staging area. And I want to give a descriptive message to show um, what I've just done, right? So git commit message. Um, I've added it for where uh, simple where adds my name to repository. Pretty cool. So I've made that commit, right? So in my repository now, there is, so we'll say that this is a single repository, right? And this was a clone of the repository, but now I have a repository which has, um, which has some changes than the one that you see here, right? This, the one that I have in my local machine um, now has this azaria.txt file, not just the license and the readme file and the hidden doc is ignored file, right? Um, so it has more changes. So I want my changes to be actually accepted here because this is the main collaboration tool that we're using to push to push all our changes together, right? So I've made those changes and I've branched off in other changes, right? So I want to push, push origin. Um, okay, it's going to an error, but um, yeah, I want to push this branch into uh, this file, right? This file right here, right? Um, so what, what has happened is I actually don't have permission to actually push to, to this repository at the moment because I wasn't actually um, given access. Um, so this is what actually happens when you contribute to open source, uh, to open source softwares um, where you're not given access. So what you'd have to do is um, not only just copy that this main centralized repository, um, this main chosen repository, uh, remember that Git is distributed. It's not really centralized. This is just a choice of using a single repository here to bring people together. Um, but yeah, you'd, ha you'd not just have to copy this into your local machine, but you'd have to also copy this um, to your own GitHub account where you actually have access to and can edit. Um, and that process is known as forking. Um, so go to um, go to this go to this URL where the repository is located, and create a fork. And that fork will be again another repository which actually lies um, in your GitHub account. And so this this one you actually have access to and can actually make changes to. Um, so 
um, yeah. So what this this remote is talking about is this remote GitHub uh, URL that we've actually chosen to track different changes to when we're um, working in a team. Uh, so um, uh, this is the command. Uh, so let's change that into, like if you can see here, this was the 10 Academy URL, which I did not have access to. Um, but this new URL that I'm providing is the URL that I actually can push and have access to because I actually own that GitHub account, right? Um, yeah. So if we now see the remotes, this shorthand representation named origin um, is now the GitHub repository that I own, which is still a copy of the main project. Okay, so I'm, I've still branched off and I have other React changes. This, the, the copy that I have in GitHub and 10 Academy's uh, repo are exactly the same at the moment. Um, so we have two exact copies, but the one that I had locally, the third copy actually has changes. And so I want to push it to my account. Um, so, uh, yeah, I want to push this other changes account, um, as I change this branch. And as you can see, at the moment that I push, it shows that I have recent, uh, I have recent pushes and there are changes in this other changes branch, right? So we can make a pull request. If you're working alone, you can make a pull request to your own main branch. Um, which would be this one. So at my accounts, uh, yeah. So it would go, it would make, so it would, it would be synchronizing the changes that, ha that happened in my local machine with the repository that is hosted in GitHub, the repository that I actually own. So this is what it's doing. It's simply taking, it is simply comparing and um, about to merge uh creating a request to merge this uh two different versions over the same account um but if we uh use a res reef um, okay so compare post works but no, where can academies branches were okay yeah so but this one the base repository is if you change the base repository to 10 academies one um it is telling it to check the changes from your accounts um specific branch which has that um name change that i made to the uh, to the 10 academies main main branch so I can create a pull request, um, which is simply a request um, to someone who has access to this repository, um, so to 10 Academy, to actually allow me to add my name into it. Um, and so to merge the changes that I made in my local repository to this repository. Um, yeah, and so this this is, um, this is definitely a long workflow that organizations follow. And so if you're new to Git or GitHub, um, definitely uh, try and see this um, flow of making different changes, um, iterating through changes, um, seeing the various commands that are available by Git, the various um, tips, uh, the various um, helpful benefits that Git actually gives us. And um, yeah, definitely make a pull request um, to, this to this repository today. Um, yeah, and go through this, go through this notebook as well. And, um, and also other, the other Git uh, resources that were provided. Um, yeah, and yeah, I, Git is going to be part of your 
workflow wherever you go. Um, so yeah, it is really nice to really build that solid foundation um, from day one and um, go through it. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's about it. Uh, Prince, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. So if anyone has any questions, let's take it. Uh, Hi. Yeah. Yeah, um, my question, I have a question. Um, yeah. In in uh, cloning your repo from uh, GitHub to your local directory, do you yeah. have to first create a directory or a folder in your on your local uh, on your local machine and initialize it before you do the clone, or you can just you know uh, clone it through the terminal and then it will uh -huh. be initialized. Um, yeah. Uh, so when you're cloning it. Um, you're pulling the changes, so the repository was already initialized. So you don't have to make a new directory. What clone does is it's literally cloning it. So um, the the repository was initialized um, somewhere back in time, um, and so you don't have to make a new repository or initialize it. Johannes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Zara. My question is. Uh, uh, let's say we we have met um, some changes um, I'm uh, having using a new branch. So first, are we supposed to pull the error case and then try to match it with the original repo or with our own main branch? Thank you. Um, okay, so. I'm not sure I completely heard that properly, but um, how are we supposed to make um, pull requests to the repo? That, that was the question, right? Um, yes, yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, this this is technically optional. If you're already familiar with Git, um, you don't have to do this, but um, yeah, it, it is the workflow that I actually followed. You'd fork, you'd fork the repository um, so have a copy of it um, on GitHub. Um, I actually did um, a longer version where I actually cloned the version from 10 Academy's repo. Um, so you can first fork it and clone the repository from your own GitHub account, which would make things easier and would make that pull request from your GitHub account's repository to 10 Academy's repository. Um, this non-visual explanation might be long, but I, I think that covers. I think that's that makes sense, right? Thanks. Uh, a little bit confusing. I will ask you one slide. Um, Clement, can you hear me? I just wanted yeah, your I... your take on uh, something we're discussing on uh, on Slack. Um, I've noticed that when you in talking about setting up uh, Anaconda, you were silent on using the graphical user interface. Uh, I just wanted your take on what is the preference on using terminal as against the graphical user interface or whether the pros and cons, if you would prefer we use a particular one as against the other. Um, uh, so if you're definitely from a technical background, um, using the terminal, of course, it allows you to really um, use more more of the commands again and again. But Anaconda is really the graphical part of it, and it allows it allows um, an easy um, entry into the world of data science and Python programming. Um, and so you do you don't have to use Anaconda. It's really a choice. It, it makes life easier. Um, when you're working on multiple projects. And so, yeah, I, I definitely recommend using Anaconda if you don't have any Python installation already. Um, and if you're starting from scratch, definitely use Anaconda. Um, it, it's really great and makes lots of things easier. But if you already have um, your own Python setup already, if you're used to creating um, virtual environments using um, Python, Python itself or other um, environment creation tools, um, yeah, I definitely follow that pipeline. But Anaconda is the easiest um, entry into Python programming, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, yeah, so I think that is that.
that does that answer it? Yep, yep, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. Manga. Manga. Can't you manga? Okay, I'll leave you, Didia. Uh, okay, uh, just to clear up things, I think for this week's project, you don't necessarily have to fork the repo, but since it's a template, you can uh, create your own repository using that template. There is an option to, uh, there is a button to click which says create template, and you can create that repo, your own repository from that template. No need to fork it. Thanks for clearing that up. Uh, um, uh, Hunan, uh, Hunso, uh, I'm sorry if I'm getting your name wrong. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I want to ask uh, for those who are in Windows environment, are there any resources for us because you are using uh, Linux, but uh, I don't know. In the command prompt, we can use the the same code cannot work for Windows. So, any other resources for those who are using window environment? There's this from your side. Thank okay. you. So yeah, um, I think we'll add a resource to the shared drive folder, um, which takes uh, Windows commands into consideration. Okay, we can add that. Um, and we'll let you know on Slack uh, once we do. Um, Kenneth? Okay, uh, thank you so much for your uh, good presentations. Uh, my question is, uh, if you are working together or in a group, and uh, we are working in our gates locally, and uh, how we are going to synchronize what each of us did. So um, yeah, so this this uh, distributed um, version control um, that Git provides is um, each of you, if each of the changes that you make um, are different. So this is really good. So the changes that you make, um, someone the change that someone else makes, they're completely different, and they're completely working separately, right? Um, so that is where GitHub is really coming into place. Um, where it actually hosts one of this uh, separate repositories, which um, has all of the changes, and so um, the cha you can you can synchronize the changes that you made, um, and you can synchronize the changes that you made with that repository, um, and someone else can uh, go on and take pull those changes that you've made. Um, so it would like. So that if some if people are working over the same file, um, there will be some conflicts, um, and there will, you're going to have to deal with merging those conflicts. But I think we can go over those advanced team concepts um, some other time as well. Um, but also the resources provided um, definitely clear those those up. But that's the general workflow. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, as I am and Burhan, uh, I think as uh, I Okay, thank you. Uh, my network was a little bit poor, and uh, may I miss some points? Uh, my question is, how we submit our assignments? Um, For whom? Uh, okay. Uh, so there, there is a Google Classroom link where everything um, that you that that you're going to submit is going to be provided. Um, Yudita, can you maybe clear that up? Um, um, uh, yes, there will be a link uh, shared to you guys separately, and I think we will notify you all when that link is ready. But there will be a, a Google Classroom link, and you'll be submitting your assignments through that Google Classroom. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank um, you. 
Yeah, so uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, let's take Brahanu's question and we'll end the call. Uh, Brahan. Okay, thank you, Azaria. Uh, my first question, is there a difference between, uh, regarding to the DDSH, uh, is there a difference between uh, fork and uh, making, using the template? The other also, uh, when we, I make most of the time a mistake, uh, I delete uh, my, uh, my repository from uh, GitHub. Uh, most of the time, when I uh, push my repository from uh, from our from my uh, folder, it, it there must uh, all my data is uh, located on my specific uh, computer. And there, this one is must always. Yeah. Okay, so like, so this the one that um, the repository that you have on GitHub is. Um, is tracking its own changes. So I'm not sure if I got it right, but like, so if you delete your repository on GitHub, um, will I still have it on my local instance or I, I, I'm not sure of the question. Okay, so my question means uh, there must always, uh, our data is located on a local machine rather than a GitHub. Um, no, it, I mean it's it's not a it's not a must uh, to have it on GitHub. You can you can use it only locally to track your changes, um, but definitely having it on GitHub servers allows for collaboration. Um, you you'd have to deal with many networking issues to actually um, expose your repository and synchronize your changes um, and work in a team. Um, was only your local repository. And so when you're working in a team, you'd have to you'd have to usually use a centralized server to synchronize the changes. Um, but yeah, you can still use it locally. Um, yeah, using it locally is fine as well. And for the first question, I'm not I haven't looked into the template, so um you did it again if you can clarify that. Yeah, okay, sure. I think you can do both. You can fork the repository as well as use the template, but uh, we made it I say we made it a template because we don't want you to have some previous commits because it's going to be your own private repository, not your private, but your own repository. There has been some commits that has been done before uh, when setting up the repository, so it's better or it's best to use a template instead of forking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think we can wrap this up here. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions that I haven't answered um, or missed on the message, definitely drop it on Slack and um, we'll make sure to review it. Um, yeah, I'll have a great rest of your day. Yes, and let is it? Um, oh, uh, I was I was on mute as well. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is, um, you were presenting with uh, a Jupyter a Jupyter notebook, and there is a test challenge. Uh, can you talk about that? Um, okay. So the test challenge. Am I aud audible? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're audible. Um, so. Mm, this Jupyter just set it, it is to just set up the uh, actual environment. I'm not sure which task you're talking about that um, specifically oh requires for that installation. Um, the 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 Git get started. There is a Jupyter notebook called Git get started, and uh, at the bottom there is, yeah. there are like resources links yeah. and yeah. there is oh, also oh, a okay. test challenge and it talks about a scoring system oh. and other stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, you, you don't have to do that. Um, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that task challenge. I think that that's what EDD have clarified right now, right? Um, since you're using a new template, um, yeah. I, I believe this this is not something that you'd have to do. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. No okay, yeah. Bye, everyone.